Hey guys, so in today's lecture, we're going to go over the medications to treat eosinophilic esophagitis. Me and Josel last semester in patho went over the pathophysiology of eosinophilic esophagitis, and we sort of touched on the medications, but since this is a farm class, that's really the main thing that we're going to discuss because we love meds here. So, by the end of this lecture, you all will be able to tell me the patho of EOE, which we're going to do a brief review. We're going to state the manifestations of the disease in the different age brackets, the adults versus the pediatrics. Y'all will know the most common treatment options, and you will be able to tell me the dosage range, adverse effects, mechanisms of action, and the recommended dosage route for each of the covered medications. Let's start into our review a little bit. Eosinophils accumulate in the esophagus. How does this happen? Eosinophils come into the esophagus from an, an immune response to something. So someone ate something, their body thinks they're allergic to. This immune response is what triggers T helper cells to recruit interleukin-5 and interleukin-13 to come into play. IL-5 aids in the production of the eosinophils. It brings the eosinophils to the esophagus and remodels the esophagus. IL-13 also brings eosinophils into the esophagus. It aids in smooth muscle contractility, and it also remodels the collagen in the esophagus. So both IL-5 and IL-13 cause the appearance in the esophagus to become a little wonky. The T helper cells are differentiated by thymic stromal lymphopoietin. When this TSLP, the thymic stromal lymphopoietin, comes into contact with the endothelial cells in the esophagus, it causes an exaggerated allergic reaction to occur. When this happens in the esophagus, the protective barrier function is altered and an inflammatory response occurs as well. Another couple of things that seem to alter the barrier function in the esophagus is CALPAIN-14 or CAPN-14 gene. But we're really not going to get onto those. This isn't the class for it, but all of these play a role in the remodeling of the esophagus, causing it to become narrowed and strictured and show the feline rings. Sometimes it's called a feline esophagus just because we have these rings. It almost looks like a cat's esophagus, apparently. I haven't looked at the pictures of that to really be able to tell you for sure, but that's what it looks like. The remodeling in the esophagus, it occurs in the basal layer which becomes hyperplastic. This causes the intracellular edema, the decreased junctional proteins, and the dilated intercellular spaces, which all of that causes a more prominent remodeling, showing more extreme strictures, the narrowing of the esophagus, crepe paper esophagus. When I was first diagnosed, I was told, and my esophagus has that crepe paper texture, so very thin and friable. The esophagus will also become stiff, and all of these factors cause dysmotility in the esophagus, which accounts for the food impactions that we may or may not see in these patients. So there's your little bit of a review there. What EOE can look like. Hopefully, y'all remember these pictures from last semester. I know it's kind of gross. These, again, are mine from when I was first diagnosed. You can see the impaction right there with the kidney bean. You can see a little bit of the rings and the strictures throughout the esophagus as well. In pediatrics, again, you will see the refusal to eat certain kinds of foods. Hopefully, y'all, I may or may not have said this last semester, but my brother, when he was younger, he had this aversion to mashed potatoes. Just the texture, something about it, he would gag every time we gave him mashed potatoes. He could eat french fries and things of that nature, but just strictly mashed potatoes, he could not do. 
he refused to eat it. You can see nausea or vomiting daily, the daily abdominal pain. I know I said this last semester, but my brother, when he was younger and still to an extent now, will say that he has a stomach ache and we'll ask him, you know, what does it feel like just to get more information? And he'll say it's like an everyday stomach ache, one that I have every day, which makes us sad, but that's what it is. You can see dysphagia, frequent gagging. So even sometimes with just like liquids, uh, EOE patients will gag. We don't know why, but that's what it is. Children may say something feels like it's stuck in my throat and that's a sign of a food impaction right there. Failure to thrive. Some of these children are allergic to so much or they will downright refuse to eat so many foods that you can have a six-year-old looking like a three-year-old. That sounds like an exaggeration, and I wish it was, but that's what we can see. We can see children constantly clearing their throat, and these children, just like adults, will get reflux and heartburn, which is why one of the medications we use to treat this disease are PPIs, because we want to help with the acid and the heartburn a little bit. In adults, we'll see the heartburn, like I just said. We'll see the dysphagia, the food impactions. Uh, odenophagia, I hope I said that correctly. That's just the like, painful swallowing, which children may have that as well, but it's more prominent in adults. We'll see the nausea, and we'll also see the abdominal pain. The treatment options for EOE, the elimination targeted in elemental diets, which I hope you all remember from last semester because I'm not going to go over those. We'll see the esophagogastroduodenoscopy with esophageal dilation. The picture I have on the screen is depicting an esophageal dilation with a balloon. So the DI doctor will put the scope down the esophagus with a little medical grade balloon and just inflate it a little bit, just so that swelling becomes easier for these people. And the medications, glucocorticoids, proton pump inhibitors, and monoclonal antibodies, which thank you, Chesley, for your video on those because that helped me a little bit with mine. Glucocorticoids. The most common glucocorticoids that I've seen to treat EOE or fluticasone, which is commonly referred to as flovent and budesonide. With the um, glucocorticoids, the mechanism of action, it suppresses the inflammation of the esophagus. They do this by decreasing inflammatory mediator synthesis and release the activity of inflammatory cells and decreasing the vascular permeability as well. Side effects of these medications, we all know them, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, and sore throat or hoarseness. This class of medication, or these two medications, are mostly used for asthma patients, but when we take them with the different routes, first, in, these, in EOE patients, we will swallow them instead of inhale them. It, we think it may help with the symptoms of EOE a little bit. With flovent, like I just said, swallowed and not inhaled. The available dose is 44 micrograms per puff, 110 microgram per puff, or 220 micrograms per puff. When I was taking it, I was taking 220 micrograms twice a day. And then I went down to 110 micrograms per day. I don't know why they told me to go down because it wasn't really helping at the 220, so it didn't make sense to decrease my dose, but I wasn't smart enough to ask. So I don't have that information. To help the patient get more of this medication, we do use a meter dose inhaler. We tell the patient to inhale just like normal, pinch the nose closed, 
and then swallow the medication. And for a few more seconds, usually about five to 10 more seconds, we'll have the patient just keep pinching their nose closed because sometimes when you don't, you can exhale the medication, which is what I did a lot. And my younger cousins thought I was a dragon because it was all coming out of my nose. Research on Clovent to determine if it was safe long term. It was done specifically in children because they're the ones that are really hit hard with this disorder. It was two to four years of age were given the 44 micrograms per pack. Four to 11 were given the 110, and 12 and older, they were given the 220 micrograms per pack twice a day. All of these children were given these medications twice a day. The results did show a decrease in the number of eosinophils in the esophagus, and it was enough to state that the child was in remission. Now, if you remember, when we do the biopsies, if we see 15 or more eosinophils per high power field, don't ask me again what that means, I don't know, but if we see more than 15 eosinophils, they have the disease. To be in remission, you need to have five or less eosinophils for a high power field in two or more areas of the esophagus. 25 of these children did end up relapsing during the study, and usually the cause was not compliant with the medication. Incorrect technique of medication um, administration, or just they went they relapsed which happens unfortunately. The study also showed that all of the visible signs and symptoms in the esophagus, the furrows, white plaques, the edema, the rings, all resolved within four to 24 months of treatment. The symptoms were greatly reduced and these were self-reported by the children or a guardian. The study did show, however, that Three of the four, 54 patients experienced esophageal candidiasis throughout the treatment and had to be treated with fluconazole. That is a side effect from Clovent, but just like any fluconazole, if you kind of switch water around your mouth a little bit, gargle, and then fit, you should be able to avoid the candidiasis. This study, to wrap it up, show that clovent can safely and effectively be used uh, for at least two years in children. You does in the head. Now this one is my favorite. This is the one my brother is taking. I'm pretty sure he's taking the um, 0.5 milligrams per two mils once a day. I believe that's what he's taking. Again, this one is also swallowed and not inhaled. The way we take this one is in the budesonide slurry. You mix it with something to kind of make it sticky, blenda, syrups with like just your everyday maple syrup, chocolate syrup, just something to create a more thick in consistency. Again, the available dose is 0 0.25 milligrams per two mil, 0.5 milligrams per two mil, or one milligram per two mil in single dose ampules. So usually, in asthmatics, they take this medication, inhale, we put it in the little, I'm blanking on the name, what the equipment is called, but they're breathing treatment, pretty much. The usual prescribed dosages for children is the 0.25 milligrams in two mils twice a day, or 0.5 milligrams per two mil once a day. In adults, it's one milligram per two mil once or twice a day, depending on the doctor. I have a video that I'm going to show you of my mom making my brother's budesonide slurry. She uses maple syrup in this video. Uh, like I said, you can use that or even chocolate syrup if your patient is allowed to have it. Hopefully this video works. Oh, that is not what I wanted to do.
There you go. That's a budesonide slurry. I think my brother was taking the video, but I'm not quite sure. I'm going to show you a picture of his esophagus before he was taking budesonide. Hopefully y'all remember seeing this from last semester. I do have permission to use these video or these pictures again. I asked my mom and she was fine with it. But you can see the rings in his esophagus. You can see the little white plaque areas, some stricturing as well. And then after budesonide, so we'll talk about the little bit of research to give him time to take the medication. Um, and then I'll show you just like, I think it was six months and what it did to his esophagus. So the research again was done to determine the most effective dose and dosage form of budesonide. This was really interesting. So the study compared budesonide tablets, two milligrams and four milligrams daily, versus the oral suspension, which is what most people are being prescribed right now. The results showed a 100% remission in those taking the two milligrams twice a day. But two milligrams per day, neither the tablet or suspension also showed also showed a significant improvement in the visible appearance of the esophagus, the signs and symptoms that these patients were reporting as well. The study was only short term, however, so we need to we need more research to be done on the long term effect effectiveness of budesonide. Um, I have down here that the tablets used in this study were effervescent, so those with yeah, we were able to safely take this form of medication. Effervescent really just means that it's dissolvable, so they can put it under their tongue, in their cheek, let it dissolve. Because uh, a lot of times, those of us with EOE, we can't swallow pills, so they've created a safe option for us. So this is the after pictures of my brother's esophagus. You can see everything is cleared up. There's no stricturing, there's no rings. Apparently this helped reverse the remodeling that happened. I need to do my own more research on this. I don't know why, aside from the fact that there was no inflammatory cells coming to the esophagus since it gave it more time to heal. That's my guess, but again, there's no really research more current research on this. The next medication class are proton pump inhibitors. We see the omeprazole, lanzoprazole, and ezomeprazole. So we all of the azoles, pretty much. I was taking, I believe it was lanzoprazole, and that one really didn't work for me. Like I said, the glucocorticoids and proton pump inhibitors didn't work for me, so I'm just Living my life pretty much avoiding what I was I tested positive to in my food allergy testing. So proton pump inhibitors, they irreversibly inhibit the proton pump. Y'all can read that big fancy term right there. The proton pump is what produces the gastric acid. We had a lecture on proton pump inhibitors, so there should be a little bit of a review for us. This inhibition causes the gastric acid production to be either slowed or even stopped, which is great. It, these medications will help with the acid reflux and the GERD that EOE patients oftentimes uh, feel. Because the effects are irreversible, the gastric acid production will only resume when a new enzyme is synthesized, which that can take a little while after these patients stop these uh, medications. The side effects that we often see, again, as we all know, abdominal pain, headache, and fatigue, those are the most common that we'll see when we take the proton pump inhibitors. Omeprazole or Prilosec, we can get it either prescription or over the counter. Usually over the counter is fine, I heard this from a pharmacist, so. <laughs> but again, talk to your doctor if you need like, confirmation. But prescription is usually with the more 
extreme dosages where we would need a prescription for it. But over the counter works just the same as a prescription. They do come in capsules, but these patients, because they have difficulty swallowing, they can open the capsules and swallow the little beads inside. I usually use applesauce. I'll get a big scoop of applesauce on a spoon, open up the capsule, pour the beads onto the applesauce that's on the spoon, and then just swallow that way. They can put the beads in their hand, throw it back, throw them back like a pill, and use water to swallow them as well. Just something to get the little beads inside the patient. The usual dosage is 30 milligrams twice a day, taken 30 to 60 minutes before breakfast and dinner. So, um, it does need to be noted that these patients can't either drink anything for those 30 to 60 minutes after taking these medications here. The Lanzoprazole or Prevacid, again, prescription or over the counter, can open the capsules and swallow just the beads using the same methods that I just described, 30 to 60 minutes before breakfast or dinner, 30 milligrams uh, twice a day. Same with azomeprazole. All of these pretty much have this work the same, same mechanism of action can be taken the same way. A research study was done on azomeprazole. It was done in Madrid at pediatric hospitals to determine if PPI therapy was safe and effective in the long term. 109 children were involved in this study and they were given azomeprazole one milligram per kilogram per dose twice a day. The max dose was 40 milligrams twice a day and they were given this dosage range for eight weeks. At the end of the eight weeks, an upper endoscopy was performed to determine the extent to which remission, both the self-reported signs and symptoms and the visible appearance of the esophagus to see if uh, remission had occurred. At this time, the parents could decide if they wanted their children to continue participating in the study, which 57 patients of the 109 did continue in the study. So they received the same dosage, the one milligram per kilogram per dose, with the max dose being 40 milligrams, and they were given this dose only once a day. Children continued at this dose for at least a year, and they went uh, through another endoscopy with biopsies to determine remission again. Histological remission occurred in 40 of those 57 children. And only eight of the remissions that were seen were partial remissions, meaning like their signs and symptoms were fine, but their esophagus appearance was not. Clinical remission occurred in all but five children, 49 were asymptomatic and three had mild symptoms. 12 children continued for another year taking half the dose that they were taking in the previous year, so 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day. 11 of these 12 children showed continued histological remission. And the most common adverse effects that were seen diarrhea, which resolved with no change in the treatment options. Uh, if the patients complained about like a headache or urticaria, they were switched to lanzoprazole, another PPI that we just discussed, and uh, those symptoms resolved as well. So, monoclonal antibodies, the Ficinera and Nucala, the Menralzabub and Mepolizumab, I think is how you pronounce those, but I'm just going to go with the center and Nucala because those are easier words. The, the center, it binds to the IL-5 receptor on the eosinophils. Remember, IL-5 is what brings the eosinophils into the esophagus and helps with the production of eosinophils as well. So if we block that receptor site, theoretically, we should be able to help treat the EOE as well. Uh, 
It causes the apoptosis of the eosinophil by bringing the natural killers that we have in our body into the eosinophil. Now, I have a note, inflammatory mediators are not involved in this, in this process. It's just the placenta versus the eosinophils. That's pretty much all we know about placenta at this time. More research needs to be um, done on this medication, specifically for EOE. Right now, it's an injection for those with eosinophilic asthma, which, since it's very closely linked, or we suspect that it's very closely linked to EOE, that's why we suspect that this could help those with eosinophil with a wide variety of eosinophilic disorders. The side effects that we mostly see with the center, headache, sore throat, it may cause dizziness and lightheadedness as well. And I forgot to add on here, just injection site irritation, normal with any injection. Um, it is the first and only anti-eosinophil and anti-eosinophilic um, monoclonal antibody given subcutaneously only. So there's really no other form to it. It comes in a box with injections usually already pre-drawn up. It is a 30 milligram subcutaneous injection, which is done every four weeks for the first three doses and then once every eight weeks for the last five doses for a total of eight doses per year. You wanna remove the placenta from the refrigerator 30 minutes prior to administration just to get it to room temperature. It can be left at room temp for 14 days before we need to discard it. It can be injected into the thigh, stomach, or upper arm, but it's upper arm only when a doctor injects it. Like most of the time, it's not even nurses injecting this medication. It is the doctor doing it himself. It's kind of salty about that, but that's okay. Uh, Nucala, it binds to IL-5, preventing eosinophil activation, therefore reducing inflammation in the esophagus that way. It's pretty much all we know about how it helps with eosinophilic disorders. And more research needs to be done. It is a subcutaneous injection as well. Side effects, headache, injection site irritation, back pain, weakness, and fatigue. Subcutaneous uh, 40 milligram injection for children, 6 to 11 every four weeks, and 100 milligrams for those 12 and older every four weeks injected into the stomach, thigh, or upper arm as well. If um, we give it in a doctor's office, it's reconstituted with 1.2 milliliters of sterile water in a two to three mil syringe with a 21 gauge needle. That's the um, recommendation on how to proceed with giving this medication. We wanna store it below 30 degrees Celsius and discard it if we don't use it for eight hours after reconstitution. There's an auto-injector pin that patients can take home with them. We don't wanna use the pin if it's been left out for eight or more hours, or if the medication is cloudy, discolored, or has any sort of particles to it. Research was done with 218 adolescents and adults. They were involved in the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. Nepolizumab, 750 milligrams, is given IV diluted in 150 milliliters of normal saline for two infusions. Four weeks after the patients received their first infusion, participants underwent an EGD or an endoscopy to determine responsiveness. The responsiveness was defined as peak eosinophil count of five or less. Um, again, that typically shows remission right there. Once participant responded to treatment, they were moved to a short-term follow-up phase, which lasted for about eight weeks right there. 
Once the eight weeks were over, the participants progressed into a long-term follow-up phase, which lasted for another eight weeks. If the participants didn't respond to the treatment, however, but they had no adverse effects, they received two more infusions for a total of four infusions total of these, these next two infusions were 1,500 milligrams diluted in 250 mils of normal saline given four weeks apart as well. So these last two infusions were double the dose that they received before. If the patient showed um, um, responsiveness after an EDD after these last two, um, infusions, they were moved to the short-term follow-up phase and then again to the long-term follow-up phase with those eight weeks each. Um, fortunately, the results of the study were not what the researchers wanted. Um, none, no one in the study met the goal of five or fewer eosinophils for high, high, eh, high power field but there was a general reduction in the number of eosinophils throughout the esophagus. The reduction was seen only during treatment in the short-term follow-up phase. So we need to see what happened in this study, why it didn't go as planned. This was the most current research I could find, but monoclonal antibodies are still um, being prescribed to these patients. I'm in a Facebook um, group, pretty much just like for encouragement for those of us with EOE, and I asked them what medications they were taking. And they listed PPIs, glucocorticoids, monoclonal antibodies, some were like, nothing is working for me, which is my case. So we do need more research. A lot of us, we do know the struggles of of these disorders and really just like trying to get the best treatment option for us, but we need more research to do that. So I hope y'all learn a little bit of something. I know I got tongue tied a little bit, stumbled over my words, but hopefully y'all learned something.